will be reading uh, three poems. The first one is from my second book, which came out in 2013, and the other two were written last year. Uh, can you hear me? I think you can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, observation of an unknown author as a victim of Penelope's syndrome. The radio is playing in one of these rooms. Silence otherwise interrupted to by the suspicion of people approaching or an envelope forgotten on the table. Unprotected and undone in your privacy, in the many ways you allow yourself to be alone, you now see that you are the one who, due to absent-mindedness, forgot to run away from the barbarians and lingered like an inconvenient guest, an idiot, with a pension for collecting postcards. And now, you have no other choice but to stay put for the plunder. Never enough to simply remember things past, but then again you are incapable of speaking up without coming at me with all that nonsense about the absolute necessity of traveling through images. And even before that, I was aware that around you one must be precise. Inaccurate coordinates can take you to the opposite polarity, to the precarious side of being the bearer of a given name, of never once having been truly coincident with an awareness of fear as something that articulates itself in the time it takes to make your guess. But let us be plain. In front of you, two espresso cups, pen and paper, all the care and the tire of which only the inexperienced are capable. It will read as follows. Last spring, you came down to this city to become a master in the art of subtraction. But now what he dreams and shortens by day Raging and frantic, he can't help but add back by night. Uh, second poem. Uh, what I know about Agamemnon's daughter. Way beyond all this is your understanding. A field of hay exposed in the inside of a lens, just before it is hit by the light. When the preciseness, when the preciseness of a moment overwhelms you and turns around exposed to itself. Like a fragment of silver paper whirling in a storm, tall stone buildings closing in on all the escape routes of inner streets where cars move at the slowest speeds. Come on, say it now. You must say it now. I have no idea what you're talking about. But that is not what I remember. What I remember is not what some classical poet might have left engraved in lines to which no breath could imprint the rhythm of speech when it comes across as human flesh and bone, not merely some literary beast, but the urgency of a body minus its plot. What I remember about her is a day of military parade when sweat glued that white shirt to the body, and I followed her into the crowd, beyond guards and lined up, and lined up people gathered together to see soldiers parade. What I remember is the sudden realization that a graceful error can be the most logical conclusion to a given public procedure, and noticing that no shape whatsoever could bring back that moment before day breaks, when a face finds its double in the glass surface of a lake. For sure, nothing about this is related to bucolic poetry, clear morning straight out of mythology, suddenly interrupted by the hours of a god in exile. I followed her, and I lost her, and still I came back to try and see her one last time, in inner streets where cafes are empty, mid-afternoon, due to the siege of routines, when secret motives are nurtured behind closed doors. Nope, I learned nothing about her world, nothing about the secrets she carried, pawn and strategist. <coughs> what stayed with me a long time after was that walk of many hundreds of meters through streets crowded with people, her long hair tied in a knot. How was I to name that before I knew what it was? Gold, dust, a paper cut in the memory of a ghost. Unavoidable, real, even before light hits the impersonality of an unfamiliar room after a night of insomnia. So, let's go. The writer's second wife. The writer's second wife lies buried not far from where he is buried. He at the center with an austere epitaph reading, he remained free forever. I am inclined to agree, even if I am not entirely sure what that means. Wooden cross and rope marking the place, and an austere high grave in black stone. 
the writer returned home to be buried in the place where he was born, the place he left in his early youth, never to come back. The writer's second wife is discreetly buried, not at his side, but in one of the corners of the garden, her epitaph featuring only her name and the time of a life that lasted, that lasted precisely a hundred years. The second wife of the writer lived long enough to survive him. The first wife, however, kept her married name long after the divorce, which happened not long after the writer encountered his second wife. This indiscreet note features, by the way, in every chronology of the writer's life I read, the bestowing of a name, first as a mark of possession, and then like the residue of gold dust that accumulates on collateral objects, objects that can be contaminated by the proximity of more expensive metals or misplaced, like one of the many fragments of, the, of Venetian or Byzantine vases, which fill in their patch-like form the rooms of the museum dedicated in this island to this writer. Like most accidental things, something fundamental is inlaid by the heavy blow of the hammer by violence and time in the harmony we cannot do without of what at first seemed an utterly irrelevant piece. Thank you. Thank you.